Hello everyone, welcome to GRIS Academy's daily editorial analysis. My name is Harish Amdi and I am presenting you editorials from the Hindu dated 19th October 2023. So, these are our topics for discussion today. Let us begin. So, there are total 5 editorials for today. I thought all are relevant to our syllabus. So, I have included all the 5 editorials, but only 2 are most important. Rest of three are very briefly important and uh, short in size. So, our first editorial is the inflation battle. So, the author is saying fear factor on the inflation battle. So, what he means is that inflation is seen a reduction in recent times. India in the past, in the recent past has seen heavy inflation, but just now in the past month inflation has seen a reduction. So, it is a good thing. But other is warning us, do not cool off now, do not take rest because the war is not over, another battle is yet to come. That means inflation, there are high chances that inflation may rise again. There are many factors that are conducive to rise in inflation in the near future. So, other is warning us and also the RBA, so not to fooled by the temporary reduction in the inflation. So, as I have said, in July, there was very heavy inflation. This is the month of July. In the month of July 2023, India has witnessed 16 month high inflation of 7.44 percent. This is very high inflation because there is something called Monetary Policy Committee in India. Monetary Policy Committee, it, is, it consists of members from RBI and the government of India. So, this Monetary Policy Committee which works under the supervision of RBI, Reserve Bank of India, has a target. What is the target? It has to keep infl inflation at 4 percent. So, this Monetary Policy Committee, which was formed under the RBI Act 1934. So, there is an act called RBI Act 1934. By making some amendments to this act, government recently has formed something called Monetary Policy Committee. Governor of RBI is the chairman of this committee. Under the supervision of RBI, this monetary policy committee has the target of keeping inflation at 4 percent, but there is a tolerance level like 4 plus or minus 2 percent is allowed. So, ideal inflation is 4 percent for an economy and even if the inflation deviates by 2 percent, higher or lower, that means 2 to 6 percent. 2 percent lesser than 4 is 2, 2 percent higher than 4 is 6. So, inflation in between this range is allowed, accepted, ideally it should be 4. So, the target of this monetary policy committee is to keep the inflation continuously at 4 percent. In September, it came to 5 percent, that means within our toleration limit. So, for now it is a good thing, for now it is a good thing, but in future it may rise again. Then other means this inflation measured by RBI he is referring to something called CPI, Consumer Price Index. So, inflation, first of all what is inflation? I keep telling inflation, inflation. So, what is inflation? Inflation is consistent rise in the prices in the products and services in an economy. So, take this example, you take a basket of goods. This year, they have costed 150 rupees or 150 dollars, let us say 150 dollars. Next year, the same basket of goods costed you 200 dollars. That means, products are same, but the prices have increased for some reason. You have experienced an increase in price. It is called inflation. This process of increase in prices is called inflation. So, inflation can be measured in many ways. In many ways, inflation can be measured. Two, in two ways, predominantly inflation is measured. They are called CPI, WPI. Consumer price index and wholesale price index. When a product was produced in factory, let us say this is a factory. Here some items, let us say Maggi noodles are being produced. Now, this Maggi noodles does not directly send to the seller, retail seller, whoever sells, sells us to at the street level market store. This product is not directly sent to him. There will be some middleman who takes that product from the factory, whether it is a Delhi, Hyderabad, wherever it is and distribute this product to the retailer sellers everywhere in every street and corner. So, that middleman sells at some rate to the retail seller, not to the end consumer. So, that 
cost price at which the middleman sells to the retail seller is called wholesale price, wholesale that means selling at a price in very bulk quantities, very large quantities. So, wholesale price transactions take in very large quantities. So, there is a level in between, uh, between the middleman and the retail seller which is called wholesale price when you measure the prices at this level which is called wholesale price index. Similarly, when this retail seller, this retail seller again sells to the final consumer like you and me. We go and buy Maggi packets from the retail shop near to us. When this retail seller sells this Maggi packets to the end consumer, the prices will be somewhat higher than the wholesale price. They are called consumer prices. So, when you measure consumer prices, it is called consumer price index. So, you can measure the rise in prices here at the wholesale level or at the consumer level. So, there are two indices based on where you measure this inflation, wholesale price index, WPA index. The inflation index I am referring to uh, RBI is CPA. So, RBI uses prices at consumer level to measure the inflation. So, RBI uses CPI, not WPA, RBI uses CPI. So, RBI uses CPI. This 4 percent target is nothing but the consumer price index inflation. So, the inflation measured through the consumer price index should be ideally at the 4 percent. So, I hope you have understood inflation, monetary policy committee, CPA, WPA, etc. You, if you want to know more, you can Google the differences between CPA and WPA. It is important for the prelims and mains also. It is a part of static economy, static syllabus of economy. Then, author is saying, regardless of the 5 percent inflation in September, this low inflation may not sustain, it may increase again because there are many domestic and global factors which are still exist, which are still existing because of these domestic and international factors that inflation rate may rise again. Further, even within this, even there is 5 percent acceptable inflation, there are some internal issues like rural inflation remained higher than the urban inflation. So, it is not equal everywhere, 5 percent is okay, but the inflation at in rural areas is higher than the urban areas. That means, people in rural areas are suffering more of increase in price. Erratic monsoon hut tariff season. Because of climate change and various issues, the monsoon of India is becoming so erratic. If you see in the past 4 years, you will read this in geography. In the past 4 years, because of a phenomenon called La Nina, La Nina, India has received above normal rainfall. This is what happened in the past 4 years from 2019 to 2022. If you see this year, the exact opposite because of a phenomenon called El Nino, not La Nina, El Nino. You will read both of these in geography. Because of a phenomenon called El Nino, India received less than normal rainfall. Till last year it was more than normal, this year it was less than normal. So, it was never average rainfall, either it is too much or it is too less. This year it is somewhat less, not too less, but somewhat lesser than the normal, somewhat lesser than the required level. So, this Karib season, which is from June to September, October, Karib season, there are, there are three agricultural seasons, Karif, Rabi and Jayad. Karif season is June to September. This plant, the crops which are cultivated during this season got hurt because of less rainfall. There was not enough rainfall. So, the output got affected. Again, what will happen in this Rabi season, upcoming season from this November to next to February is uncertain. Karif already lesser than the normal. Uh, Rabi crop, crops are all somewhat uncertain. So, there are many uh, factors that may affect the inflation in the near future. When there are products are less, when the agriculture output is less, the prices will be higher. If there is enough production, prices will be normal or lesser, supply demand logic. When there is too much demand and less supply, prices will be higher. So, because of these kind of factor, inflation may rise again. Again, another one, till now we are talking about consumer price index, CPA as I said. When you, when you consider WPA, wholesale price index, it is actually showing deflationary trend. What I am saying till now is that CPI is definitely increasing. 
prices at consumer level are increasing. The rate of increase is lessening. So, in July month, I have told you inflation level is 7.44. As I said, inflation is inflation means increase in prices. So, inflation definitely means increase in prices. So, in July there was an increase, but it was 7.44 percent compared to the July last year. If you take September, I have told you increase is 5 percent. That means, compared to last year September, prices of this year is 5 percent extra. So, both are seen as increase in prices, but the rate of increase is different between July and September. That is what he is saying. I, when I am saying inflation is falling, I meant the rate of growth in prices is decreasing, but still there is a growth. There is definitely a growth. It is positive. Growth is positive, but the rate of growth is decreasing. This process is called disinflation. So, when the rate of inflation keeps falling, it is called disinflation. So, I, I, I meant to tell you the difference between two similarly sounding concepts called disinflation and deflation. This is my intention. So, what is disinflation? Inflation exists, but the rate of inflation is decreasing. So, that is what disinflation. What is deflation? It is the exact opposite to the inflation. Prices are not increasing, prices are decreasing. So, in disinflation, prices are increasing, the rate of increase is decreasing, but in deflation, prices are not increasing, prices are decreasing. That means, if you consider wholesale prices compared to the last year of the same month, compared to the September 2022, prices in September 2023 are less. So, WPA is showing deflation. So, both are acceptable. De Disinflation and deflation both are okay, acceptable till extent. Somewhat, as I said, 4 percent inflation is good for a healthy economy. Some inflation is good for a healthy economy. So, long term, in long term, deflation also, even though it means lesser prices because of some other economic reasons, you will read economy. In longer term, deflation also not healthy. 4 percent of inflation is healthy for economy, balancing growth and prices of products. So, because of all these factors, CPA, WPA, monsoon, all these factors we discussed in future, there may be a rise again in inflation, there may be unhealthy trends. So, other is warning us, do not take for granted, it may rise again. However, the increase in global oil and gas prices and prices of urea, etc., which are India's significant import, will start to feed into retail prices soon. It is time not to celebrate, do not celebrate yet. There are some warning signs. There are two wars going in the world right now. One is Russia-Ukraine war and Israel-Hamas war. When there is a war, you cannot produce peacefully. So, Russia is producing so much oil in normal times. Ukraine is producing so much of fertilizer under normal times. Now, all Ukraine is under war. Then how will those factories work? Automatically, there will be a short of fertilizer like urea. So, for some international reasons, the prices of oil, natural gas, and fertilizer, etc., are rising. India needs to import these kind of items. So, our import bill will get increased in near future and is also increasing right now also. So, when these prices, when I import something, I will also sell at higher price within India. So, we are importing inflation from outside also. So, this is not a time to celebrate. We need to be caution about this. That is the first article about the inflation. You can link this to our syllabus in GS3 economy. Okay. Our next article, ferry service between India and Sri Lanka, a small ed smaller editorial, but it is related to our syllabus. So, I just wanted to mention it. Okay. So, see the title here first. Sea service on the ferry service between Kankasundrai and Nagapattinam. Sorry for my pronunciation. So, the news is that recently a ferry service has started between India and Sri Lanka, a ferry service, state of Tamil Nadu, India and this Jaffna region, this northern region is called Jaffna region in Sri Lanka, between these two regions, a ferry ship service was started. This is a good sign because earlier there were ferry services between India and Sri Lanka, they were actually quite successful. In the past, they were quite successful, but because of some reasons, civil war in uh, Sri Lanka, these ferry services had to be halted. So, after nearly 40 years, ferry services last was continued till 1982. In 1983, civil war happened in Sri Lanka. 
and from 1993 till 2023 there were no ferry services so it started again so what is this 1983 civil war in many countries of the world usually you will find many ethnicities if you see in india right now there is a growing difference between hindus and muslims maybe because of political reasons or some other reason in every country there will always always be some people who wants to take advantage of this uh, majority minority conflict okay in sri lanka majority people are buddhist if you take the composition of sri lanka majority are buddhist these buddhists dominate in rest of sri lanka except northern part next next i see tamil sri lankan tamils so tamil not not indian tamils this sri lankan tamil exist in northern region of sri lanka where we have started this ferry service so this northern jaffna region is dominated by tamilian sri lankan tamilian muslims and christians also exist in sri lanka here and there but traditionally there is a conflict historical conflict between this sinhalese buddhist buddhist and this uh, tamilians because this sinhalese see tamilians as indians they say long ago during british times or even before these people from india Uh, migrated to sri lanka in the northern region so these people has to go back these sinhalese people don't accept that uh, sri lankan tamils as native people as a citizens of sri lanka so there were ethnic conflicts in sri lanka and there is a terrorist organization formed in this sri lankan tamils so if you see how, how many years anyone take the oppression so after some years there is a organization called ltte formed in sri lanka ltte so you must have heard about tiger prabhakaran so he is the leader of this ltte so this ltte fought on behalf of uh, sri lankan tamils against the sri lankan army so there was a civil war within sri lanka the civil war is between civilians of the same country so tamils of sri lanka and sinhalese of sri lanka uh, in the name of army has fought a war ultimately it has ended in 2019 it started in 1983 started 1983 in 2009 it has ended you will read it in international relations india sri lanka relations you will read it detailedly i just gave you a brief so in 2009 that ltte was fully demolished by the sri lankan government so now they have reached a peace accord uh, now there is there are some signs of peace between sri lankan tamils and sinhalese so that is the past because of this civil war because of the civil war this ferry services between india and sri lanka in the past got stopped now we are starting it again so it is a good sign because it is an opportunity for india and sri lanka to restore the relations full sense in full sense so these initiatives will strengthen civilizational ties cultural ties economic also involve cooperation in disaster management so sri lanka is in a uh, undergone any disaster an earthquake or a tsunami or flood india can respond immediately so it will also result in cooperation in disaster management maritime security both uh, together can take care of piracy etc so this indian ocean region towards the gulf and uh, africa indian ocean region usually have many pirates somalian pirates etc so both countries when they cooperate with each other they can cooperate in maritime security also it may at some stage also enable seamless voluntary repatriation of thousands of refugees from sri lanka living in tamil nadu so when i said about this civil war in sri lanka during this civil war of sri lanka many tamil sri lankan tamils migrated to india as refugees because there is a war going on so people are being persecuted to to avoid that persecution persecution many tamils have have fled to india so now all of those people still living in india so now if we are having good relations with sri lanka with um, proper uh, transport services now we can repatriate these people so please read this topic as a part of gs2 international relations uh, our relations with neighborhood relations as a part of neighborhood relations in gs2 under the broad theme of indian sri lankan relations so you can mention this as a part of where sri lanka and india are cooperating with each other recently a ferry services Uh, has been started between india and sri lanka so this can use as a fodder example in mains also they may ask directly something in prelims you can even refer to the maps here so if you take the geography geography part of that our discussion 
the Gulf of Manar here between India and Sri Lanka on the southernmost side. Then there is Park Bay, then there is Park Strait. So, if you go from south to north, south to north, first you will see Gulf of Manar, then you will see Park Bay, then is Park Strait. So, I hope from geography you know this difference between strait and gulf. Okay, please read it. Gulf is some narrow water body protruding into a surrounding land. So, if this is land, this is land word, water body protrudes into the land like this, it is called gulf. Strait is something which connects to larger water bodies. Here it is Bay of Bengal, here it is Indian Ocean. So, something which connects to large, larger water bodies is called strait. So, next uh, article, women's paid work, women's paid work. So, the theme of this article is that in society, usually men are recognized for their work, men do work and they are properly recognized for that. Other with the help of data is proving that women work more harder than men. It is just some part of women's work is invisible and she is not paid for it and she also does not get any recognition. So, the title is Measure of Working Women. See the uh, subtitle here. Women's unpaid work is responsible for 7.5 percent of GDP. It is not that uh, e even though women's work is unpaid, still her work contributes to the 7 percent of GDP. Indirectly, she contributes to the 7.5 percent of GDP. That is very high. So, in other words, not only women shoulder the burden of domestic work, they also boost the GDP. So, we think women do all these household work, all these household work, society, because of society rules and regulations, usually becomes a responsibility of the woman and all these elderly and child care work, uh, taking care of sick people, older people, uh, tendering to the child, cooking and cleaning in the house and uh, arranging all the fuel and etc. for the house. So, all of these work usually are unpaid. Women were not recognized for these kinds of work. But still, this kind of work contributes to the GDP in many ways. So, uh, we will see in detail, author is explaining in detail. A parent working outside the home must have someone to take care of the child. So, uh, there is a traditional model, okay, breadwinner caregiver model. So, traditionally, traditionally, when there was no these type of gender type differences, people did not uh, see women as a lower gender when human have relatively innocent conscience some model emerged breadwinner caregiver okay every animal every animal on earth has to work to get this survival or food an animal has to hunt to get the food a bee has to go to the flower to get the honey so every animal every animal on the earth has to work for its survival or to get the food same with human if they want to have some food or they want to have some any kind of uh, facility, wood for the house or anything, cleaning, water for the cleaning, etc., whatever they want, they need to work. So, someone has to go outside and do the work. At the same time, humans also need to take care of their people, their children, their parents, old age people, anyone who is disabled, anyone who got ill. So, there are two kinds of work here. One is within the house, one is outside the house. Outside the house, Work outside the work, work outside the house is seen as breadwinner. The person who is taking the work inside the house, that means giving services to the other members of the family is seen as caregiver model. So, out of the necessity of the human family model, one of the spouse has to be breadwinner. Now, there is a husband and wife. One of them has to be breadwinner and one of them has to be caregiver. So, over the years because of some biological plus additional social reasons which are not necessarily biological, we have evolved a model that men will go outside and earn the bread, okay, earn some food for us. Women will stay inside the house and she will take care of the household responsibilities. So, in older times this model was fine, okay, when one person is going outside to take care of the uh, financial and other needs of the family, someone will stay at the home and take care of the children and the others. This model was fine till, till the older times. Now, the world is changing, India is changing. Even in this kind of model, even if you take this kind of model or in the modern times, all women work, but not all of the women gets paid. So, this is being proved by this recent 
Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Claudia Goldin. She is an American economist. She read the whole American history and with the example she has shown that how, how at various stages in American history, women have always did hard work, same as men, sometimes even more than men, but they did not always get the recognition. Even in the modern times, she explained how women are not able to enter the labor force because the conditions of market are very constraining for a woman. Society says one thing to the woman, but economy, the market does not take care of what society says. The rules of the society does not matter to the market. That is the reason woman is not able to work same as men. People are saying uh, women are not uh, biologically designed to work as men. No, that is false. She says you, the, you, the problem lies in the market structure. You say, you know that because of the social reasons, because men are not fully evolved, women cannot roam at night. And you say, women has to take care of the children. So, she has to stay with the children at least throughout the night. Then why are you creating something called night shift? You know, women cannot come, come outside the home at the night. Still you are saying, uh, you still you are creating this night shift. So, by your very inherent model, you are eliminating women. It's not that woman is making a conscious choice. Uh, I have this opportunity, but I don't work. Woman is not making a conscious choice. The structure is limiting her. If you remove the night shift, if you make the work 10 to 6 to everyone, then more women will participate. It will enable more women and men equally. But if when you, the moment you create night shift, I, this is a particular example I am saying. The moment you create night shift, you are systemically eliminating women. So, with the help of data, she destroyed many stereotypes. Dr. Claudia Goldwyn. So, she received Nobel Prize recently. In India also recently a survey was conducted. This is a survey recently conducted by National Statistical Office, NSO. This survey revealed many things that 81.2% uh, 80, of women are engaged in unpaid domestic services. See, such a high level, 80% of more than 80% of women involved in domestic services which are unpaid. They don't receive any money for you. If you notice one thing, nothing is inherently uh, invalid. Okay, everything has some value inherently. When a woman cooks in house, it is as a normal thing. Okay, no one attaches money, time or for that thing. If our mother cooks at home, she, we, it is seen as very normal, natural duty of our mother. But let's say we have gone to some other city. No one is there to take care of us. We will hire a maid. Then we will pay to that maid for the same work our mother did. We will pay some 5,000, 10,000 to that woman for cleaning and everything. Okay. Again, when you make a restaurant, a deluxe or luxury restaurant, there you have to employ some high class chef. Suddenly, what is the natural biological responsibility of a woman becomes a man's, man's eligible job. Men are eligible now. When you go outside, you will see more men as chefs, okay. You will see more men as chefs than women. But when the same cooking is done at house, men will say, this is the responsibility of women. Women are naturally suited for cooking. If women are naturally suited to cooking, why are there are so many men outside working as chefs? So, everything has some inherent value. Society, society makes it gendered, okay. Cooking is not inher inherently men's or women duty. Society said that, please you take this. Society asked women to take this, but the moment women took this work, society said you cannot work outside, you are uh, biologically suited to this. So, that is a kind of stereotype. So, 81 percent women engaging in domestic service, but they are not getting paid, they are not getting recognized compared to 26 percent of men. So, low, 20, only 26 percent men work in domestic services which are not paid. She finds that men spend 42 hours on an average in production. When engaged in production outside the house, we get a monetary reward, okay. Men spend for a week 42 hours. On an average, a man spends 42 hours, revealed in, in this survey. But on an average, women spend only 34.6 hours in work, in outside work. No, sorry, on an average, only women spend 19 hours in employment, in production. So, the production for which we receive monetary thing, men spend 42 hours on an average per week. But a woman spends only 19 hours. Average. This is average for all men and all women. So, if people see only this thing, only monetizing, people will see that men work significantly higher. 
almost three, two to three times comparatively more than women. But people do not see that. If you take within the household, which is not paid, on an average women work 34.6 hours, but men work only 3.6 hours. So, if you see how much men is working per week, 42 plus 3.6, 42 outside 3.6 inside, which is 45.6, let us say 46 roughly, men work 46 hours a week, paid or unpaid, men work 46 hours per week. If you take women, she work 19 hours outside. 34.6 hours inside, which means it is coming around 53.6. So, it is roughly 54. So, men is working 46 hours a week, paid or unpaid. Women are working 56 hours per week, paid or unpaid. So, you see almost women are working roughly 8 hours more than men per week, which is translates to 1.5 hours per day. So, with the help of data, with the help of data, author is showing me, official government data is showing that in our country, women work more harder than men. On an average, a woman works 1.5 hours more than men. But still, women get less recognition. Women are not recognized for the work. Women are tied with the work. They are overburdened with the work. Still, they do not get recognition or money. There are two implications because of this. Because of this, women working extra than men and not getting proper recognition, two implications. One is, women are burdened with a double burden. Okay. There is an American sociologist, he done a work called the second shift, the second shift. Her name is Arlie Hochschild. So, in this book called second, the second shift, she explained how at work she performs the first shift. Okay. The, her whole work uh, throughout the day is first shift, but when it comes to her house, she starts performing the second shift. That means, she has to work even though she is working outside. Responsibilities of her inside the household does not get reduced proportionately. Okay. There is no commensurate reduction for the work within the house when even the woman works outside also. So, this is double burden. She is working outside like a man, overburden. She is also working inside again overburden more than man. Another one is that care work they do spend on time is not counted. Even the official statistics, statistics of the government count only this work, outside work, whatever the work we do in production, men and women, government in its official statistics only count the production activities, not this care activities, care work done inside the household. We have already seen in the previous slide, in production activities, men perform higher time and in care work, women perform more time. Within the household, women work more time. So, because you are ignoring this thing, even the official data of the government is also showing that men are working more than women. Which is not true, which is not true. Another facet, another facet, another facet. So, if you see there is another side to the story. We are talking about women who work more inside the house than outside till now. Till now, we are talking about women who are performing more care work, less outside work. Let us take the case of women who work outside, same as men. Women who work outside, same as men. Usually, these are people who are from low income families. For women who are from low income families, from poor families, if she does not go outside, family will not survive. Only on one earner, family does not survive. If you take a middle, middle class family or rich family, Earning of one member is enough for survival of the family. But if you take poor families, both parents have to go to work. Otherwise, the survival of the family does not get assured. So, women from low income families, they have to go outside and work same as the men. But they get less support from the government because, see, because of same kind of responsibilities. These women who are going outside same as men, still they have this household responsibilities given by the society, like taking care of the children and six uh, older and six people in the house. Because of these re, uh, extra responsibilities, women who have to go outside, still they cannot take regular employment. Even these kind of women who need work outside, who need to work outside, even they cannot take full regular employment. So, they have to take like seasonal, sporadic and irregular work, okay. Some like MG Narega, if you take, there are more women in MG Narega, the skin 
is a lifeline for women. But if you take why those women cannot take full work, MG Narega only guarantees 100 days of work per year. I hope you have heard of something called MG Narega, which is an employment guarantee scheme in rural areas. If you take the case of this MG Narega, this act guarantees 100 days of work, only 100 days of work per year. So, and again, if you go and work at some other city also, like agricultural fields or uh, in Punjab, etc., many works are seasonal. They are not fully year throughout the year continuously. Many works usually taken by these kind of poor women are seasonal, irregular. They are not continuous. And many of them work in their own family businesses. So they are not officially listed in some kind of employer, uh, employ, employees list, etc. So the, these people work also not visible to the government properly because they are not on regular employment. They are very seasonal or irregular or invisible employment. These people are going outside and working to monetary benefit, but still they are not visible to the government. They are, they are not fully included in the government policy. So they receive very less support from the government. Like uh, for all factories, there are four labor codes. Okay? Four labor codes of the government. You must have heard it is. In India, all workplaces are governed by four labor codes. Code on wages, code on occupational health and safety, code on social security, etc. So these, there is another labor code also. There are four labor codes which regulates code on industrial relations. I think the fourth one. So these four labor codes regulate the production activities in India. Because these women are not even uh, recognized by the government, seen by the government properly, the protection offered by the, these labor laws is also less for these women. Domestic obligations keep them from regular employment and when they do, it is often with the children in the tow. And these people, these women, unlike the other women who stays at the home, take care of these people, to take care of their children, those women who don't have to work outside, they take care of their children at home. The woman who don't have to go to outside, she takes care of her, her children at home. That is fine. But these women from low income families, especially, they have to work. They, they have no choice. They have to go outside and work. But they have children responsibilities. So they take the children along with them. Just imagine a construction worker, someone who works in a house construction in a big city. You, you will see this frequently in many cities that, uh, that children of the people also comes along with them to the workplace. So how is the workplace of a construction um, place? There is a lot of dust. When you construct a big apartment, there will be a lot of sand, bricks and everything, etc. The whole environment of the construction environment is very hazardous for the child. The child will inhale all the dust in the air, all the sand in the air, all the drilling, etc. So when children go along with these mothers who work outside, it is usually not safe for the child. The, the healthy growth of the child will get troubled, it is not assured. Like other children, they may not get the healthy growth. So this author, with that help of the data, just highlighting various issues of the women working and these women who are working inside the house without any recognition. So author is highlighting various issues government need to sort out for all these kind of women. So now these women, working women has the problem of children along with them. Now there are two kind of solutions here. First one is for rural women. One is this Anganwadi system. I hope you have heard about this Anganwadi system. If you don't know, please Google about it. Anganwadi system exists in both rural and urban areas also. But it, it is actually more, more suitable to the rural areas. Because in rural areas, that community bonds are stronger. So someone will be there to take care of these children. There is an Anganwadi system to take care of health and educational uh, needs of the children before the school period, that means before uh, less than three years, preschool children, that, that age children, Anganwadi system takes care of them. But Anganwadi work only from 9 a.m. to 1 a.m., 1 p.m., 9 a.m. morning to the 1 p.m. only. This is the time of Anganwadi. So still a woman who wants to work from morning 9 to evening 5, 8 hours work, she cannot take care of her child uh, afternoon session. Anganwadi take care of only morning session. So still someone has to take care of the child in the afternoon session. So even such a, such a support exists from the government in the form of Anganwadi. Still woman is not able to take full work. In urban areas, more than Anganwadi, Krishi facilities are more suitable. These are Krishi facilities examples. Krishi facilities are facilities for taking care of children at the workplace itself. Just think she is a government employee. She is working in some EPFO or some other 
government office special facility is that within the same office building there will be some separated room just to take care of the children younger children so when you provide those special facilities women can work more freely at the workplace because their children is very nearby and they can continuously monitor them this krishi model works better in urban areas and this anganwadi model if you extend this field to afternoon it works better in rural areas private sector recognizes this need private sector recognizes this need that working women need someone to take care of their child so private sector recognized and it is earning many high income from this preschool child care facilities nurseries preschool facilities etc so rich families uh, from women uh, women from rich families are able to afford this preschool so their children are taken care properly by someone this is an example of preschool facility private sector very high fees are taken from the parents so rich uh, rich parents can afford this but poor families cannot afford even these kind of facilities so public sector government has to provide such kind of facilities to the poor people who has to work for their survival so that someone can take care of the child in a healthy way in conclusion the traditional breadwinner caregiver model whatever the model humanity has devised over the years in the traditional sense it is not conducive in the current times the world is changing india is changing now we want our economy to grow the mode of organization of society has now changed now society cannot survive by work of the men alone women needs to work in current times and india has a high ambition of becoming a 5 trillion dollar economy right now we are almost at 3 3 trillion dollar economy india gdp size right now is almost 3 trillion dollar india has an ambition of becoming 5 trillion dollar by 2025 this is a target which prime minister again and again speaks about so if you want, if you have such high targets you have to take the help of women in special workplaces you have to promote employment among the women now we have discussed the challenges women facing in this gaining this kind of employment so we have to take care of the challenges to get women fully into the workforce to ensure high participation from women in the workforce and to become this 5 trillion dollar economy so this can be achieved in two ways one is first recognize women work whether she works at home whether she gives care to the elders or to her children first recognize it in the monetary value value appropriate as i said when women cooks at home it is not valued no monetary or time aspect attached to it but when the same woman performs work at some other house not her own family some other house it is valued or when the same men or women go outside and perform the same work in a restaurant again it is valued but if within the household of her family it is not valued so first government should take some initiative to value the household work next one is women must adequately supported in economic activity outside the home as i said women who has to work outside has to work outside they have some issues like children someone needs to take care of their children such kind of support should be provided when you take care of these two aspects women can fully participate in the economy if you take our current situation women labor force participate uh, rate is 32.8% that means women who can work women in the working age population among that population only 32.8% are working so if there are 100 women who are capable to work only 32.8% of women are working so rest 68% are not working even though they can work they can work they can contribute to the economy but they are not contributing because of various constraint like this so government needs to improve this female labor force participation rate it is low if even compared to the china which is our international rival even our neighbor bangladesh has more uh, female labor force participation rate than us so if india wants to raise its female labor force participation it needs to empower its women and it needs to destroy myths around women work and must be dispelled and women's work must both be counted appropriately and supported fairly as i have discussed so you can connect this to gs1 also role of women etc and gs2 also interventions of the government here the intervention is in the sector of gender equality very interesting article artificial intelligence just come in
So, next article is artificial intelligence and digital uncertainty. So, the author talks about digital uncertainty. So, first start with what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is a hot topic now. So, there are some ongoing hot topics Israel Hamas war, same sex marriages, artificial intelligence. These are very important topics for next year maze. Especially artificial intelligence, it will always be in use as a disruptive growing sector. It will be in use for the next decade also because it is continuously evolving. It never stops. It is continuously evolving. So, artificial intelligence is important for every year films and maze. Whenever we see in news, at least to the extent mentioned in the news, all the vocabulary mentioned in the news, we should know about it. So, the author talking about various kinds of artificial intelligence in this article, which we will see. So, first start with what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is the ability for a computer to think and learn. So, artificial intelligence is nothing but imitation of human intelligence. That means, when computer thinks and learns like human, imitation of human intelligence by a machine is called artificial intelligence. You see, artificial intelligence has so many applications. Applications of AI, robotics, marketing, chatbot. If you open IRCTC website, IRCTC, you will see something called Gisha. The moment you open IRCTC, you will see something called Gisha. So, this is a chatbot. It is an artificial intelligence chatbot to help you in booking tickets. Automation, e-commerce, self-driving cars, medical diagnosis, computer vision, facial recognition, space exploration, medicine. So, there are too many applications, education sector. So, artificial intelligence is everywhere because it, it is mimicking the human intelligence. So, wherever human is uh, required at the lower levels especially, at the low skills level, wherever human is required, now they are getting replaced by the artificial intelligence. So, just understand the importance of artificial intelligence from this slide. That is what I meant because there are so many applications of artificial intelligence. It is now being used everywhere in the world, by every company in the world, in every sector. So, there is a widespread use of artificial intelligence in the world. Now, the author is saying all the companies in the world are blindly using artificial intelligence without realizing that artificial intelligence comes with some threats. There are some threats associated with the artificial intelligence. So, he is issuing a warning about those threats. So, ultimately he is saying, please proceed with caution. Recognize the threats, be cautioned, do not blindly apply artificial intelligence. It is not foolproof. That is what the author is saying. So, first we should know about types of artificial intelligence. First we should know about types of artificial intelligence. Why? Because the author is talking about two different kinds of artificial intelligence and the threats that may emanate from it. So, first see about this type of classification. Artificial intelligence can be classified in many ways, many ways. Artificial intelligence can be classified in many ways. So, just one kind of classification is this, generative and non-generative AI. See all in the name, generative AI, generative. Please focus here, very confusing this slide, so I will explain very clearly. Generative AI versus non-generative AI. What is generative AI? It is in the name. This generative AI is capable of generating something. Non-generative AI does not capable of generating something. So, non-generative AI only responds to my introduction. It does not create anything. You, some examples are ChatGPT, BARD, DALI, Microsoft Bing, etc. So, this ChatGPT Chat is very famous right now. I hope you, I guess you have heard about this chat GPT. So, what is this chat GPT? It is an artificial intelligence application developed by an American company called OpenAI. There is American company called OpenAI. It developed this chat GPT. So, if you just Google chat GPT, open it. You just have to open it through Gmail. If you go to chat GPT, you can talk with it. You can talk with this chat GPT. If you ask it to produce an essay, Take the UPSC paper of this 2023 and you give the topic of the essay to this chat GPT and tell it to produce an essay of 1200 words. The same way UPSC is asking you, you ask this chat GPT to write an essay on a given topic. It will write, it will write in the way you have mentioned it. If you say 1000 words or 1200 words, it 
will produce an assay and usually assays of chart GPT are very good. Chart GPT is very, uh, very good in giving UPSC type assay, very good, I have tried it. So, chart GPT produces an assay on my instruction, it produces text on my instruction. So, that is a non-generative AI. So, it generates text. Some people also use some other kind of artificial intelligence to produce some images. Uh, I think these days in social media, frequently you will see that AI photos, AI photos, AI photos. So, what is this AI photos? Nothing but this generative AI which generated those kind of images. So, generative AI can produce text, video, images, etc. Non-generative AI just replace it. If, if you ask a non same like this Disha, Disha for Disha of IRCTC. Disha only tells me what is already there. I will ask Disha how I can, how can I book tickets. There will be already decided pro, uh, procedure on IRCTC. So, Disha just conveys that to me. It does not produce anything. It just responds to my introduction, my instruction. But generative AI produces some new content which is not existed till then. This is one classification. Now, understand generative. This is generative. Come to next kind of classification, classification 2. Now, there are two types. One is narrow AA, which is also called weak AA. And the second one is general, general AA, not generative. Please note the difference between generative and general AA. What is general AA and narrow AA? So, see here, narrow AA or weak AA, everything is in the name. So, when I say narrow AA, I mean its intelligence is limited. Its intelligence is limited to a particular task. Again, I am coming to the example of Disha. What is the purpose of Disha? Method booking on IRCTC. So, other than that, Disha cannot perform anything. If I give a math problem to Disha, it cannot solve. So, it is a VK. It is only dedicated for one particular task. But if you take general A, it performs all actions of humans. So, it is creative like a human. So, forget this super AA, see only these two, narrow and general AA. Narrow AA, you, narrow AA is something you design for a particular task, but general AA is nothing but the imitation of human. Whatever we can do, general AA can do. So, it, it can perform like human, even in some cases it can even cross the intelligence of human. So, super AA is nothing but an advanced stage of general AA. So, Usually, you can say there are only two types of AA, narrow AA and general AA. Super AA is a part of general AA, an advanced stage of general AI. So, what is super AA? When this computer or sorry, when this artificial intelligence crosses beyond the human intelligence and performs a task which you cannot perform, as it is shown in all the sci fi movies, whatever the AI is shown in all the sci fi movies is super AA, X Machina, Matrix. Terminator, all of these movies are super AA, even this uh, Robo movie of Rajni Khan. So, super AA, which is a part of general AA, is shown in all of these movies. So, it is mostly a fiction, it does not exist in real world. Till now, we are only here. Humanity as of now is only at the stage of narrow AA, but many organizations in the world, many countries in the world are working on general AA. They want to produce this general AA. But other is saying, okay, you are being desperate to produce this general AA. But you are not understanding, it may be a threat to the humanity. He is explaining, we will see. So, countries are rushing to produce this general AA, but humanity is not comprehending the possible threats of this general AA. So, I hope you have understood generative AA and general AA. Now, other talks about these two, generative AA and general AA. So, as I said, general, generative AA generates content, generates content and because of this generative AA, some problems are there. Now, misinformation campaigns, fake images, now I can generate anything, okay. So, you see this cyber uh, criminal, they take some random images of some random person or actress or woman and they create a fake image and they claim it as a original thing of that particular person. So, this is a cyber crime done with the help of generative AI. Again, recently I have seen some news that there is an image of a child, there is an image of a uh, 4 or 5 years girl, that post, that particular Facebook post is claiming that she was brutally killed in Pakistan by Muslims. She is a 
Hindu woman brutally killed in Pakistan. So, that particular author who is in India, particular uh, Facebook person who has po posted that uh, on Facebook, calling for revenge in India against the Indian Muslims. So, even whatever he is saying is true, some people in Pakistan did to some Pakistani citizen, which is the res uh, that responsibility of providing justice falls on the judicial system of the Pakistan. But here in this post, some with some communal intention, some person is calling against revenge against Indian Muslims. First of all, that post itself is not verified because that post itself seems very, very unreal, like some image generated from this artificial intelligence. So, unless unless I am wrong, it is 99 percent fake, which can be identified easily through forensic analysis. And that uh, uh, all the remaining aspects will go into the political domain. I am not going into it, but understand generative AI has such much potential. So, that much easy it is to create conflict between two communities using generative AI. You can produce something, ordinary people cannot identify which is real, which is false, which is fake, which is real. So, generative AI comes with many challenges. First of all, it will change all the skill landscape. Okay, now. As I said, chat GPT produces good essays. I have told you. Now, let us say a school student was given a work to write an essay. What he will do? He will go to the chat GPT and he will type that, ask chat GPT to produce an essay. Whatever it produces, he just copy paste it. So, in negative sense, it is useful. Again, if you want to learn uh, essays for UPSC, you can take the help of chat GPT. I have taken many model essays from chat GPT. I have seen how chart GPT is constructing assets. So, I have learned something from it and I have used it in this year mains. So, such kind of generative AI you can use in both positive and negative sense. Anyway, that potential itself changes the skills landscape implicitly in terms of underlying threats and damages. Okay. So, read his full point, please read it fully. Again, there is an exponential explosion of digital uncertainty. So, all of things are creating digital uncertainty. As I said, which you can trust, which is true, which is false, we don't know. We don't know. It is blurring things. This generative AI is causing a blurring in things. People not able to identify which is real, which is not. If, if you have heard uh, few months back, something happened. Some video got viral in Tamil Nadu. In that particular video, Northeast people got getting attacked brutally by some Tamil people. So, that video claims Northeast people are not safe in Tamil Nadu. So, please whoever is from Northeast, please go back to your native places. So, suddenly seeing this video, all these Northeast people who are working as uh, migrants or some other workers in Tamil Nadu, suddenly they took trains and rushed to Northeast. So, suddenly trains got flooded. It is a fake news. It is not a real news. It is an old video. People modified it using some technology and that got spread also through technology. So, it is an example of fake news causing panic in the society. So, that is a digital uncertainty. Those people, those Northeast people, no, those Northeast workers seen it. They do not know it is true or not. Now, they are feeling fear. Why to take unnecessary risk? What if it is true? So, even if it is uncertain, out of fear of their life, they have ran back to Northeast. Only few are able to fully comprehend the nature of this threat. Only few realize this kind of intrinsic problem which results from this. So, not everyone is seeing threats from this generative AI and also general AI, which we will discuss next. And not able to see these problems coming with this. We are, we are thinking, okay, this will change the world. This is a new kind of technology. But under the same, pro, uh, on, under the same better uses, there are also some threats which we need to be caution about. Uh, one such thing is cognitive warfare. This is a good example. In 2017, Donald Trump has won as US president. He has become US president and later they got to know that, it might, it might not be 100 percent true, but later they got to know that Donald Trump has funded a campaign, uh, funded a scheme using the help of something called Cambridge Analytica. So, this is a company Cambridge Analytica, Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica, this is the name of company. So, using Facebook, 
this company posted some uh, post manipulating the opinions and feelings of the Facebook users. So, this Cambridge Analytica using some fake images boosted the fan base for the Trump. So, the extent of role of Cambridge Analytica in the win of Donald Trump is unclear, but it definitely resorted to some unethical ways in Facebook. Later, they got tried by the uh, US judicial system. So, this Cambridge Analytica faced some charges late because of the campaign, social media campaign it has organized for the Donald Trump. So, that is a cognitive warfare using some specifically designed posts. They are manipulating the cognitive aspects of the Facebook user. So, that is cognitive warfare, Fa uh, fake information, disinformation. So, audience thinks and sees something as I explained in this example of image from the Pakistan. So, they are saying this is an image from Pakistan, we do not know, but it creates some emotions in us. Are our community girl got killed, how can this be allowed? So, we should take revenge. So, they are manipulating with the emotions of the people. So, cognitive warfare is one of adverse output of the generative AI. Next, similarly, it breaches confidentiality and loss of governance capabilities, same. If what, what would have happened if that post of Pakistan has created some conflict between two communities in a city? Manipur is burning now, Manipur is burning and uh, government has suspended the internet there because they do not want to uh, allow the spread of fake videos. Same as I said this uh, reverse migration of northeast people from Tamil Nadu to their home states, why that happened? Because of this generative AI fake news, government could not control it. Government is trying to say that is fake news, but people are fearing for their life. So, there is a failure of government. They cannot assure safe living and safe working of Indians within India. So, generative AI caused loss of government. Then psychological techniques of manipulation, same that Cambridge Analytica. Many companies in the world are putting themselves directly at risk from AI by investing in intangible assets like cloud technologies. So, everyone is adopting AI, AI, AI. One such uh, advance is cloud technology. So, earlier I am a Facebook, uh, I am some user, some random user. My data is stored in India earlier before this Facebook, uh, Twitter era. If you take like 30, 40 years back, whatever I do, my data is within India. Whatever a, a Spanish user does, his data is within Spain. Same with American, his data is mostly in America. But now these companies are coming, they are doing something called cloud uh, technology. So, what is cloud technology or cloud computing? Now, everyone's data is being stored at a single place. My data is stored in America. That Spanish person data is stored in America. American data is also stored in America. So, everyone's data is stored at a single place called cloud. It is a cloud where people can store their data. Now, I do not have to store the data in my own laptop. I do not have to burden my hard drive with data. My data is stored in cloud can I, so that I can delete the data on my computer. So, it frees up space in my computer. So, all of these companies are investing in such kind of technologies which can be easily attacked using artificial intelligence. So, by using this artificial intelligence in a negative way, these kind of cloud technologies etcetera can be easily attacked. So, there is a harm in the patterns of the new, new usage of A. So, these government, uh, these companies are going towards technology, but it also comes with some negative consequences. There is not enough understanding of how the very nature of information is being manipulated. Extent to which drives of all this drastic transformation, all this contributes to what can be referred to truth decay. So, I have explained the, the whole point already. So, now the very nature of information is being questioned. What is true? What is not? People do not know. So, there is a truth decay in the society because of this generative AA. So, let us come back to general AA. Now, let us go general AA. I have explained the difference between generative and general AI already. Please do not get confused. Till now, we have discussed about generative AI, which can produce some content, which can produce fake images, which can produce fake videos, fake text. But this is general AI. General AI means intelligent AI, which is at least 
equal intelligent to human or more intelligent than human. So, when you see general AI or artificial general intelligence. So, AGI or general AI both are same which this means super intelligent artificial intelligence. Imagine a super intelligent robot shown in science fiction movie. So, whatever is happened is just tip of the iceberg. This is the bigger thing. When this comes everything is going to change. This is much much larger whatever we are seeing all this fake information and everything is only just tip of the iceberg. When this general AI comes everything will get severely disrupted. What is simultaneously accelerating and terrorizing is that many advances in AI are now being birthed by the machine itself. So, this general AI has creativity also. Generative AI creates something but based on our instruction. Now, this general AI produce something on its own will. It is in on its path to sentience or it can gain sentience. So, it creates on its own something. Now, when people use this kind of general AI for that particular purpose, let us say America has achieved designing of this general AI. Now, America has come this general AI. Now, it has automatic advantage over other countries. Same China. If China gets hands on it, this kind of general AI, it becomes more powerful country. So, the in future, this, <coughs> this kind of uh, general AI will lead to more level of inequality. So, countries which are already being researched on this general AI, countries which are doing their research on general AI will gain some advantage because all the poor countries, all the poor African countries or southern Asian countries, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, these are comparatively backwards in space compared to the other countries, America, China, etc., who are at an advanced stage in their research on general AI. So, when some countries achieve this general AI, the countries which are backward in research get colonized by this country. So, we will see a new kind of colonization in the past when British and other European countries gone through something called industrial revolution. They have got advantage with this kind of machines. Now, Indians we can produce cloth, cotton cloth, but we, we only know the way of production through hands. We do not know how to operate this machine, but these Britishers know the technique of machine. So, they came here, they took the raw materials from India, all the raw cotton and they have sent it to England. Now, using the machines, they have produced cloth in very bulk quantities and then the final products again, they came back and sold here in India. So, it is the colonization. They are forcing us to take, sell the raw materials. They are using machines and advanced technology. They are making end products and again, they are selling the same in India. So, India has to buy something which it used to produce at more higher cost now. So, when some countries same like industrialization and machine technology. Now, when some countries have this technology of artificial intelligence, general AI, now it will also lead to colonialism, same in the past. They will take raw data from countries, backward countries. Same as Britishers took raw materials from us. Now, these advanced countries take raw data from these backward countries. They make end products and softwares, new updated softwares and they sell it back to poor countries. So, sooner or later we will witness this general intelligence. So, it will happen, it will ultimately happen. Right now, there is no general intelligence anywhere in the world. People are researching on it, but sooner it will become a reality. Artificial intelligence that is equal or superior to human intelligence, which will penetrate whole new sector, replace human judgment, intuition and creativity. So, as I have explained, when it comes, everything will change. It will have its own judgment, intuition and creativity. So, I have, I have explained this also. So, when it comes now, it will more, it is more disruptive and dangerous and the inequalities in across the world and within countries increase, people who have access to this general AI will have some advantages. So, rich people using this general AI become more rich. Companies this Amazon and uh, this Netflix already they are using general AI, uh, some kind of advanced gen, uh, early forms of this AI. So, these companies are already having advantage. Whenever the rich people have an advantage, now they will have a robot as a helper. When a rich person has access to this AI, 
he will take a robot as a helper okay a poor man has to work hard a poor man doesn't have to work hard so when this general a comes inequalities will increase and it will result in uh, more disruption it will replace jobs it will replace people in jobs there will be economic displacement so all the low skilled people as i said now there is a household worker working for some low amount 5000 or 10000 now he will buy a robo for lifetime he doesn't have to pay it every month it works on normal battery charge so here a low class person has lost his job same at may, in many cases you can imagine the all the loss of jobs because of the new ai and robotics the specter of digital colonization looms large as i have explained some countries gains advantage and they will colonize the other country has happened in the past in the 18th century because of industrial revolution now this new general ai may result in something called digital colonization countries will take raw data from the backward countries which are countries are backward in the stage of research on general ai and the data will be taken to the countries who achieved this general ai then they will make some super products then they again they will send the super product to poor countries when general ai comes we will be at a point called open hammer movement so what is this open hammer movement i hope you have seen this open hammer movie recently by christopher nolan in that open hammer movie it was shown that this scientist called robert open hammer who designed the atom bomb for india when he is designing this atom bomb during world war 2 in 1940 initially he was very excited to design the atom bomb he thought okay this is something which i can help in world war for america so i can ensure the win of america and its allies so i will design a bomb which will make america more powerful so initially he was excited but the more he is doing research into this atomic uh, energy he is he got to know that this has the power to destroy the world when when this energy when this explosion of atoms becomes uncontrolled it will destroy the whole world there will be a cycle of destruction so which will lead to the destruction of whole world he know that it was a possibility it was shown in the movie so again again it will also it may also lead to arms race imagine in 1940s he is thinking if one country gets its hands on atom bombs another country like russia who is the enemy of the america after the world war 2 they became enemies cold war so if america makes atom bomb russia will make another bigger bomb if russia makes bigger bomb america makes then china makes then india makes when india made pakistan also tries to make a bigger bomb so there will be an arms race in the world this time it's nuclear very powerful bomb so oppenheimer was worried about these two things one it may destroy the world second one it may result in nuclear arms race so the initially excited oppenheimer later got somewhat caught in a dilemma he got he got caught in a dilemma should i pursue or not because this is very threatening to the world he is not sure his work is helping for humanity so his dilemmas were shown in this oppenheimer movie so that is a oppenheimer moment he is facing a dilemma when this generative ai comes world will also face again an oppenheimer moment now we are excited about this but if we continue on this path what will happen in future we don't know as oppenheimer felt the dilemma it now became a reality now there is a nuclear war race in the world many countries got their hands on nuclear race iran and uh, many other countries saudi arabia wants to design, design this nuclear weapon and there are five countries p5 of united nations security council all of them are superpowers they are they have become superpowers only because they have this nuclear technology so when this general ai comes we will be in open hammer moment we do something which we do not fully understand so that is a threat to the humanity A can be exploited and manipulated skillfully. So uh, all the examples I have said, this northeast uh, migrants, refugees, and this Pakistan fake image. So all of these examples are how you can use A for exploitation and manipulation. Another example author is giving that recently on 7th October, there is a terrorist group called Hamas which attacked the countries, the country of Israel from a neighboring geography called Gaza Strip. So in news you must be reading these days, there is something called Gaza Strip. There is a Hamas terrorist group organizing from this Gaza Strip. It is operating from this Gaza Strip. 
on 7th October, it went into the country of Israel and attacked the country of Israel from its southern border. So, how a terrorist agency can uh, was able to perform this operation? Because Israel intelligence was very famous in the world for being so um, successful in, in their operation. Okay, so by the level of its famousness of this Israel uh, intelligence company Mossad, in Israel intelligence agency Mossad, it should have identified that this group called Hamas is planning a terrorist attack on our own country. It should have identified if you go by the traditional norm, but it did not identify Hamas was able to perform this terrorist attack. Why? Why Hamas was able to perform this terrorist attack? Because Israel intelligence agency started using artificial intelligence more and more in its operation. So, Israel intelligence agency adopting this AI more and more. Now, Hamas has exploited it. Hamas was able to feed wrong data to this artificial intelligence systems of Israel. So, Hamas somehow managed that this Israel intelligence agency could not be able to track the Hamas. So, they have performed this terrorist attack by using artificial intelligence in an unethical way. So, author is highlighting such kind of things can happen with artificial intelligence. So, do not over depend on it and do not believe that it is invincible. Artificial intelligence is not foolproof, it is not invincible, it can be defeated, it can be manipulated, it can be used for wrong ways also. So, that is with this article a pretty long article, but once you know all these terms and basics of it, it keeps recurring. So, every time you when you see an article on artificial intelligence, you will understand. So, this general and generative AI are very important. This is the last article, very small article, I will just explain it in brief. So, there is something called Belt and Road Initiative of China. China in 1950s, 60s, when India got independence after 1947, both China and India are more or less same. But over the years, China did some things in its economy, which resulted in growing the economic size. So, China became a very rich and powerful country. Its GDP has grown many times. India is growing now, but China was 20 to 30 years earlier than India in implementing this economic reform. So, India is growing now. China has grown in 1990s and 2000. So, by 2010, China became a very powerful country in the world. It is even challenging the US. After the fall of Soviet Russia in 1990, till 2010, no one was able to challenge US at the world stage. US was the sole powerful country till 2010. By this time, China has grew as a strong country. Now, China is challenging even America at the global stage in various issues. So, in 2013, China uh, thought of something called Belt and Road Initiative, which is also called One Belt, One Road. So, what is this Belt and Road Initiative? So, China wanted to connect all the countries in the Europe, Africa and even South America to China. So, it wants to implement so many infrastructure projects like power plants, roads, ports, railway lines. So, it wants to give money to some countries. So, it wants to give loans to these countries and they will build some projects. Later, they will repay the money to the China. So, these countries will get infrastructure projects. Let us take the case of Sri Lanka. Now, China will say, I will build a port in your country. China will say to Pakistan, I will build a port in your country. I will give you the money. You keep the money for now. You get the port city. But only two things. One, I will send my people, Chinese people as labor to the Pakistan. Pakistan labor are not allowed. Chinese come to Pakistan and they will build the port and give it to you. You will get the port. You will earn some revenue. Later in future, you repay me the money. So, those are the terms and conditions put by the China usually under this BRI, so many countries, all South Asian, many African countries and some European countries also are part of this Belt and Road Initiative. It is just to boost the global power of China. China wants to become a global power at the world stage, so China thought of such a scheme. Okay, so it has also some other advantages to China, like see, if you see this Malaysia region, see this is India. Andaman and Nicobar, here it is Malaysia, Indonesia. If you see this between Malay Malaysia country, if you see on geographical map Malaysia country, 
there will be something called Strait of Malacca. Please open your atlas and see Strait of Malacca. So, Strait of Malacca is something very small narrow path through which many supplies of China will go. So, if China wants to take some oil from the Saudi Arabia, it has to go through the Strait of Malacca because sea routes are shorter, I mean sea routes are cheaper, they may be longer but they are cheaper. There is no other way because there are other countries in the path. So, without passing through any country, there is only one path through the Strait of Malacca for the China. But it is very narrow, very small. If some country like India going into a war into China, let us say there is a war with China, China and India gone into a war for some reason, for some reason they have gone into war. All India has to do is to choke the Strait of Malacca, nothing goes into China. All the supplies to China get stopped. So, it is a very vulnerable point for China. You will read about this in geography and international relations. Just understand that for various strategical, geographical, economical and at a global international uh, relations re related reasons, China is doing this Belt and Road Initiative. Now, this Belt and Road Initiative is comparatively successful because more than 150 countries more than 150 countries in the world are participating in this Belt and Road Initiative. That means it is very successful. India is not a part of Belt and Road Initiative, why I will explain in the next slide. So, it is quite successful, but it is not without controversy. So, many countries who are taking these loans from the China are getting caught in the debt trap. So, there is a country called Laos. Laos has taken so much loan from the China. Now, it is not able to repay, it is severely burdened with the loans of China. Again, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka also not able to repay the loans of the China because of the rates of interest are very higher. The revenues and the projects built by the China are lower. So, China has taken back a port in the Sri Lanka. So, China built a port with its loan in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is supposed to earn a revenue from this port and pay back to the China, but Sri Lanka is not able to pay back. China has taken over this port. Again with Pakistan, there is something called Gwadar port. There is something called Gwadar port in Pakistan. China is constructing it under the Belt and Road Initiative, but when Pakistan conducted a study, it realized that 90 percent, 91 percent of revenue from Gwadar port somehow is going to China. China designed it in such a way that 91 percent of revenue is going to China, a mere 9 percent only is going to Pakistan. So, Pakistan is not being benefited to the, from the Gwalior port, but it is paying interest and original amount on the loans given by the China. So, it is not profitable to the Pakistan. Same in Laos, same happened in Indonesia. Some Indonesian people uh, came to the public roads and they are protesting. Why are Chinese coming to our country and working here? Why not Indonesian people can construct these projects? So, Chinese projects are not without controversy. So, there are many problems with Belt and Road Initiative, which many countries are not able to realize right now. So, there are some alternatives proposed to this Belt and Road Initiative. Um, India and USA, etc., these countries do not want China to rise because China is a not a good player. China does not follow rules. China is like an autocrat. If India rises uh, to the world power, India rises as a world power, India still follows the rules at a global stage. But when China becomes a global power, China is not following the rules. It is threatening many neighboring countries. So, it is behaving like a bully. It is behaving like a big bully. So, some people want to counter the growth of the China, US and India, etc. So, there are some partnership at global level are being planned to counter this Belt and Road Initiative. But none of these initiatives are being successful as Belt and Road Initiative. So, still it is a work, still it is a work. India also trying something to counter this Belt and Road Initiative, but till now it is not such a successful thing. We have to see how future turns out. So, how this will go in future depends on China, how China will manage these concerns what are the concerns being raised against this Belt and Road Initiative, how China will manage this, we have to see. The future of BRI remains a topic of great interest because how China deals with it 
related to whether China becomes a global power or not. If China is rising, that means it is a disadvantage to India. So, in GS, see this from GS2 perspective, there is a syllabus line called policies of development and developing countries and its impact on India. So, how this BRI progresses will have an impact on India. So, analyze it from GS2 perspective and India-China relations also. So, that is it for today. A quite long editorial video, but way I did is that all of these are related to the static syllabus. So, simultaneously we are able to uh, study some static part also. So, ultimately whatever the time you have spent, it will definitely uh, give you some positive result. So, please uh, follow us daily. We are also uploading prelims videos separately. So, every day we are uploading two videos, one is for prelims, one is for mains. So, this is the editorial video directed towards the mains and another video we will upload following this for prelims. So, every day two videos, prelims and mains. Thank you.